My dearly beloved in Christ, I would like this morning to cover two topics of theology. So today's sermon will be different from a normal sermon where we speak about the gospel and about the spiritual life. But I think it is important to cover these two aspects. In a way, as you will see, they deal with error on the left and error on the right. And as Catholics, we must adhere to what the church has taught and follow the straight path of truth. Now, the first topic I want to address is Fenianism. We have not had a problem of it here, and so I haven't spoken much about it over the years. But in our parish in the Boston area, it has been an issue because Father Leonard Feeney lived in Boston, and that's where he was excommunicated right around 1950 uh, by Pope Pius XII. And Father Leonard Feeney was excommunicated because of his erroneous teachings. He disobeyed his superiors when they transferred him to another house, and he was a Jesuit priest, and he just left and went from bad to worse. And basically what he taught was an exaggerated interpretation of the church dogma that outside the church there is no salvation. And what he taught was a denial of what we call baptism of desire and baptism of blood. Now, these uh, ideas, baptism of desire, baptism of blood, which really, in a way, are the same, have always been believed and taught in the church. In fact, there are several martyrs whom we honor in the liturgy who were never baptized. And it says in the Acts of their martyrdom that they were baptized in their blood. Before they were able to receive the sacrament of baptism, they professed their faith in Christ and they were put to death. They were baptized in their blood. Baptism of desire, on the other hand, would be not actual death, but where one desires to be baptized and dies before he or she is able to be baptized. So the church has always taught that one can be saved through these means of baptism of desire, baptism of blood. Now, the Feniites will say, well, you're making it three baptisms, and there's only one baptism. St. Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And they fail to understand that it is a figure of speech which indicates that one can obtain the grace of baptism who has not been actually baptized with the sacrament of baptism. So this is the area of error of Father Feeney, and it has been a scourge of the traditional movement because we as Catholics recognize the errors of Vatican II. We don't want to be misled into the liberal ideas that just about everybody goes to heaven and that it doesn't matter what you believe or what religion you adhere to. Just about everybody goes to heaven, if not everyone. These modern liberal errors of our age. So some people tend to go to the opposite extreme and follow the condemned teachings of Father Leonard Feeney. Well, we had a seminarian in our seminary in Omaha whose family fell into Feeneyism. They gave him things to read. He read them, and he became all mixed up with Feeneyism. He left our seminary and found a bishop to ordain him. And then he went to a place where we have a church, a parish in southern Minnesota, and he misled some of the people there and started his own little group. Well, there were two men in that parish who were quite concerned because they had, as the saying goes, they had a dog in the fight. They have relatives who were misled by, his name is Father Dominic Crawford. So they wrote a book. It's an excellent, excellent book, and it's called Contra Crawford, A Defense of Baptism of Desire and Periodic Continence. And these two men, two laymen, wrote the book under the guidance of His Excellency, and with the help of some of the priests. And they have in the back of the book a pamphlet that Father Crawford wrote and passed out to the people. And then they go through it point by point and answer it. And one, one of the interesting things that I find in this book is they have a chapter in which they show how the Feniites distort and misquote the 
saints or fathers of the church that they quote from. For instance, St. Augustine, they take one sentence out of one book he wrote and then a phrase from a completely different book and then something else from a third source and they put them all together and when you read it, it makes it look like St. Augustine is supporting them. And so that's very dishonest journalism. Now I mention this because this book is available, um, it can be purchased very inexpensive, I think six and a half dollars, and then with, with uh, shipping and handling it comes to about ten dollars, but you also can read it for free online. So if you're interested in either purchasing the book or reading the book online, you can send me an email and I will send you the links to both, where you can purchase it and where you can uh, access it online. So it's something we should be aware of. As I said, it's never been a problem here, but unfortunately it has misled many otherwise good traditional Catholics because again, they don't want to fall into the liberalism of the modernism. And so they have been misled into adopting this false idea of rejection of baptism of desire. As I was mentioning at the Fatima conference, when you really think about it, what Father Feeney taught, what it logically leads to is the belief that there are souls in hell who are in the state of sanctifying grace. In other words, someone who through supernatural faith and supernatural love and contrition receives the life of grace, but, be, but are not baptized and so therefore they're sent to hell. In fact, there's a wonderful story in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, about a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And he, with all his household, he was very devout. He prayed every day, many times a day. He was very good to the poor, almsgiving, etc. And an angel appeared to him and said, send for a man named Peter. He lives in this city and ask your servants to go and bring him here and he will tell you what you need to do. And when St. Peter went there with his companions, they were amazed because they saw the Holy Ghost come down upon Cornelius and his family. And they hadn't been baptized yet, but they received the Holy Ghost. That means they received the life of grace. They could not receive the Holy Ghost if they were in the state of sin. And St. Peter then went on to baptize them. But the point here is that this exaggerated idea of baptism of desire uh, leads to a number of, I'm sorry, exaggerated belief in the dogma of no salvation outside the church rejecting baptism of desire leads to a number of erroneous ideas. I, I had one article in the Reign of Mary in which Father Feeney, I read through his entire book, Bread of Life, and he would say things like, well, if someone wasn't baptized and they're trying to do the right thing, it's just too bad, just too bad. He even says, when you go to heaven, most of the Americans that you will meet in heaven are below the age of seven, meaning they were baptized and died. So that it makes achieving one's salvation almost impossible to, to accomplish. There was one man who used to go to our mass in Boston and he fell into Feneism and he's very obstinate in it. And I've tried to help him. And I asked him this. I said, can you give me one theologian, just one, in the history of the Catholic Church that taught that baptism of desire and baptism of blood are wrong. They're heretical. They're erroneous. And of course, he could not do that. He could not give me one theologian. And yet all the theologians that have addressed this subject teach baptism of desire, as did St. Thomas Aquinas, the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent said is it, it is impossible to achieve salvation without baptism or the desire of it. And St. Alphonsus Liguori, that great doctor of the church and saint who lived after the Council of Trent, because of that teaching said it is de fide to accept baptism of desire and baptism of blood. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out because it has become an issue in one of our parishes and indeed we've our priests have met people who have been misled by this. And oftentimes, sadly, they tend to be pretty obstinate and hard-headed and, and not willing to see the other side of the issue, what the church has taught and the saints, etc. So if you're interested, again, you can send me an email and I would send you the information on that. Now that's an error we might say on the right. Now today I wanna to talk about error on the left 
namely Vatican II. And I want to address this because a very tragic thing took place today in Rome, because of course Rome is like nine hours different in time zones. So the so-called Pope Francis canonized Paul VI and Oscar Romero. And it is absolutely incredible to me to think that anyone can believe that Paul VI was a saint. First, Oscar Romero was a Marxist bishop in El Salvador who was killed. He was assassinated in 1980. Now, he was one of these that supported what is called liberation theology, which is an attempt to marry, so to speak, Marxism and Christianity. And at that time, they were going through a, a sort of civil war in El Salvador between a, a military government and all of those that were promoting Marxism. And it's tragic that he was assassinated, but how can you canonize someone who supported Marxism and promoted Marxism? But far more horrendous to me is the canonization, the pretension that Giovanni Battista Montini, who was elected in the conclave of 1963 and died on August 6, 1978, and that during those 15 years, he gave to the world the Novus Ordo Mise. He promulgated all the decrees of Vatican II. He changed the right of all of the sacraments and all of the terrible evils that came into the church with communion in the hand, the loss of reverence, the guitars and the bongo drums in the church, all of that is the fault and the responsibility before God of this one man, Paul VI. There is no one else that has the degree of culpability that he does for everything that happened. Yes, John the 23rd started it, but Paul VI is primarily the person responsible for all of the evils that have come to the church and led astray millions, millions of Catholics. So he was canonized this morning and now supposedly he is a saint. Uh, several years ago, Francis canonized John the 23rd and John Paul II. And now it's Paul VI. And when he announced back in February that he was going to canonize Paul VI in October, he said with a sort of a chuckle, he said, and Benedict XVI and I are on the waiting list, which is the absurdity of pretending that every false pope of the modern church is automatically going to be canonized, going to be a saint. I've spoken before and written in the Reign of Mary about the absurdity of these endless canonizations that they have now in the modern church, taking something that was so sacred, that is so sacred, and pretending that... Um, all of these individuals and, and others besides are saints. It, um, it, it treats canonization like a farce. But the greatest farce of all is the pretension that Paul VI, who destroyed so much that was Catholic, that he is actually a canonized saint. So we have to be very careful to avoid the errors on the left and the errors on the right. And speaking of Paul VI, there's, there's an excellent book, or there are many books, filled with his quotes, things that he said that are heretical. Let me give you just a few quotes. And this just pertains to one subject. Now, I lost my marker here. Um, this pertains to the subject of man. Paul VI was a humanist. He, as it were, deified man. So listen to th these quotes from him. Are you looking for God? You will find God in man. Another quote, we, more than anyone else, have the cult of man. And a third quote, man is master of himself. He is free who is the cause of himself. So he was very much a, a humanist, a secular humanist. He went to the United Nations and proclaimed that the United Nations is the last great hope of mankind. And again, started the whole, well, John the 23rd started, but Paul the Sixth primarily completed Vatican II and has continued to pro promote in his 15 years this new religion, which now is being promoted by the so-called Pope Francis. 
It has nothing in relation except a few trappings in relation to the true Catholic faith. So let us beware, wary of the errors on the left and on the right and adhere to the true faith and follow faithfully in the path of the faith and give thanks to God every day that we have the true faith and pray that we will not be led astray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.